All right. Hello, everybody. I'm taking down all my sticky notes that told me to record. We should be recording now <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> all right. Thank you again. Uh, the League of Women Voters is delighted to host this Power Hour of Facts and Insights into our 2020 elections, allowing voters to hear directly from the officials who were in the room where it happened. All of the information being discussed here tonight really can be found also in the detailed documents and instructions found on the Secretary of State website. In preparing for this webinar, I was amazed at all the incredible detail of policies and procedures that are cited by statute on the website, which govern our elections, and the certification and training required to administer them and to ensure the integrity of voting registration and our voting systems. But despite the strong and secure mechanisms we have in place, we know, however, there continues to be ongoing questions about the 2020 elections that are undermining public confidence in our voting system. So tonight we'll hear from an esteemed group of panelists who will help answer those questions and share their firsthand experiences about the detailed systems and measures we have in place, which should help all Minnesotans feel confident that our elections during the pandemic were safe, fair, and accurate. So thank you so much to all the officials who are joining us this evening. We have, of course, Secretary of State Steve Simon, David Maeda, Director of Elections, Office of the Secretary of State, Pat Dolan, Head Election Judge for Washington County, Deborah Erickson, Administrative Services Director in Crow Wing County, Andy Loken, Elections Director, Dakota County, uh, Michael Stahlberger, Director of Property and Environmental Resources, Blue Earth County, Nancy Nilsen, Auditor, St. Louis County, Phil, uh, Phil Chapman, Election Supervisor of St. Louis County, and Paul Huffman, a ballot board member from Washington County. We also thank all of our attendees for joining tonight. Feel free to put questions in the question and answer box. We're not running a chat tonight, but we do have a Q&A box and we'll try to address them. Because we have so much on our plate, we may not get to you all of your questions, but we will answer them in the follow-up email we send to everybody. So don't worry, we'll get your question answered somehow. All right, then, Secretary Simon, we'd like to start off our conversation tonight with you. Uh, thanks for kicking off our webinar and helping to shed more light on the first step in the voting process, and that's voting registration. And we were hoping especially you could share with us how do people prove their identity during the voting registration process and how is that identity verified? Right. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. And I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting together this panel tonight. It's my honor to be with these other panelists. They're the ones, most of them, who do the frontline work during elections. Our office doesn't hire, train, or pay election judges. Many on this panel, they're the ones who do that. They're the ones who run the polling places. Uh, but it's a team effort, and we work together, and I think we've got a great partnership. Um, and, and let me just say, before I answer your specific question, thank you for uh, mentioning what, um, what is really in the background of all of this. There's been, uh, despite tremendous success, despite an election where democracy really um, distinguished itself, where our institutions held, where the system worked better than ever, despite a once in a century pandemic, let's remember. And Minnesota got, again, for the third time in a row to number one in the country in voter turnout. Despite all of that, there is some lingering uh, disinformation um, about the 2020 election. Rather than repeat what the allegations are, let me just say what the truth is. The truth is that the 2020 election in Minnesota and really nationwide, but particularly in Minnesota, was fair, accurate, honest, and secure, period. That is a fact. Now, was it perfect? No, and I think all the panelists will tell you there are always some quirks, but this was a really solidly run election and the panelists deserve a ton of credit for making that so in Minnesota. Now to your question about voter registration. So even the term voter registration um, could stand for a little demystifying here, right? Um, uh, if someone didn't know anything about elections, and they heard that term. It sounds a little menacing, almost registration. What does that mean? You know, what do I have to? What do I have to show or do or promise? But really, registration consists of two things, basically. When a voter when someone but registers to vote, they really have to make a showing of two basic things: that they are who they say they are, and they live where they say they live. That's it. That's the whole deal. That's what voter registration is. 
And when you zoom out a little bit and you look at what you can provide to show either or both of those things, Minnesota distinguishes itself by having a very long and I would say very forgiving list of things that you can use for both. Anyone interested in the particulars can go to our website at mnvotes.org, mnvotes.org, and see the long list of things that can uh, be used for one or both of those. It's not just a government issued photo ID, although it can be, and it very often is. Um, it, it can be numerous things up to and including something that we call vouching in Minnesota. Vouching is a simply uh, a system by which someone who doesn't have one of the things they need to show that, for example, they live where they say they live, um, can have someone in their precinct, basically a neighborhood, um, for lack of a better term, their precinct can go and vouch for them, which is to say under penalty of perjury that that person lives where they say they live. My own father in a particular election a while ago, uh, my parents had moved uh, to a new place in late October. They didn't have a, uh, a utility bill or some of the other things that might uh, uh, they might have used in order to um, uh, prove up what they had to prove up. And so my father used vouching. He couldn't have uh, voted in that election. It was a governor's election. It was 1998. And he couldn't have uh, voted in that election had he not done that. So that's basically all that registration is when you really think about it. Um, and then it's up to folks in the counties and cities and local government who do the work afterwards of, of making sure that they, uh, uh, they, they verify that or if there are any challenges that they look into those challenges and anything that can't be reconciled, anything that can't be uh, definitively determined must under Minnesota law, there's no discretion, it must be turned over to law enforcement. And the fact is, when you look at the end of the at the end of the day, and this goes to some of the disinformation we're hearing, we have a minuscule, minuscule incidence in the state of Minnesota of any wrongdoing, whether it's a mistake or anything else when it comes to election law. And just as long as we're talking about voter registration, then we have a state of 5.6 million people. We have about 3.3 million voters. And the numbers every year that must be reported to our office, by the way, by law enforcement, end up being a couple of dozen or so in the typical year. And I, so I just wanna put that in perspective. Any number larger than zero is too many. Any one of us on this panel, we want it to be zero. All of us do, but we just have to put it in a little bit of perspective. So it's, um, it's you have to show that you are who you say you are and you live where you say you live. Bottom line is we have a long and forgiving and generous list where voters can um, uh, make use of any number of documents to show either or both of those things. Awesome. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, we now welcome David Maeda, Director of Elections for the Office of the Secretary of State. And David, if you could walk us through the mechanisms and measures of the vote by mail or absentee voting process. And we have some specific questions that um, our voters have asked tonight, specifically what safeguards are in place to ensure that people don't vote by mail multiple times or vote by mail and in person, especially when there was no witness signature. And we also had the question about the mail only precincts. Uh, what are those and why do they exist and who do they represent? So a lot on your plate here tonight, thanks. Well, thank you, Michelle. And thank you to the league for inviting me to participate in this. This is great that you're doing this. And I will start off kind of echo echoing what Secretary Simon just said, a lot, there's a lot of misinformation, disinformation coming from the 2020 election with the belief that we don't have any safeguards in place and that there's fraud, ma massive fraud going on with mail-in and absentee ballots. That's absolutely not true. Absentee ballots have been used in Minnesota for a long, long time, actually going back to the Civil War days. That's when absentee balloting re really began in the country. And so it's been a process that has been used for a long time. And of course, we have developed many, many safeguards to make sure that um, the voter who's voting the ballot only votes one time and that there are safeguards in place to ensure that. I should step back and kind of give some definitions here because some terminology really does get mixed up. Absentee vote, anybody that votes before election day is has to fill out an application to vote absentee. We don't have what other states know is early voting where it's more like you go to a vote center that's like a polling place and you sign in like you do on election day and vote. We don't have that in Minnesota. Even when you're going to your county office or some city halls in the state to absentee vote in person, you are not early voting. You're still absentee voting. And the key distinguishing thing is you have to fill out an application. That's the first step in getting an absentee ballot 
is completing an application that includes your name, your address, your birthday, then either your um, a driver's license or state ID number, or the last four digits of your social security, and then you attest to an oath on the application. Our office in 2020, and I'm sure the counties too, got a lot of calls from people saying, why am I being mailed 25 ballots or 10 ballots? I haven't heard anyone that that actually was the case. And, I, and actually we have things that I'll talk about that would prevent that from being the case. We did have several groups, outside groups, mail our voters absentee applications, and that's perfectly okay. Any, anybody can mail you an application. It's your right to throw it away and go in person and vote at your polling place on election day. But because of COVID, um, absentee voting really took off in Minnesota in 2020. Our office met early on with the Minnesota Department of Health to develop some safety guidelines on how we were going to get people to vote and vote safely in 2020 with the pandemic going on. The Minnesota Department of Health basically said the safest way to vote is to vote at home by absentee. And so our office really took that to heart and really pushed people. If you have any concerns about voting at your polling place, which of course could have a large group of people in it, um, vote at home by absentee. And that was really a push from, from our office. We ended up actually doing a mailing to any absent, any registered voter in the state that already had not submitted an absentee application. And the way we track this is every application gets entered into the statewide voter registration system. It gets tied to a registered voter if the person is registered. So there's an absentee record tied to the voter registration record. And that's one of the safeguards not allowing people to vote, get more than one ballot. If the person loses their ballot, they can be sent a replacement ballot. But each ballot, absentee ballot record that gets created in our statewide system, it's assigned a unique barcode. And so we are able to track the ballot that gets mailed or the, the ballot envelopes that get mailed to the voter with the, the voted ballot returned by that barcode. And that's in SVRS. So if, if a voter record has an absentee record attached to it, there is no way that person is going to get more than one ballot because every absentee ballot that gets mailed out has a record within our statewide system. For non-registered voters, it's a slightly different process. It's, you still have to apply, but you, of course, have to fill out a voter registration application to get registered. But then there again, it mirrors what happens at the polling place for people that register on election day. Uh, Non-registered absentee voters has to have somebody, a witness, look at the ID that's required for election day registration, and that person has to check off a box on um, the envelope indicating that they actually saw the ID required to election day register. Um, but again, a record is created within SVRS, even for non-registered voters, that tie the specific ballot packet that's sent to the voter so when it gets returned, we know it's the one that got sent out. And I believe you have a ballot board person that's gonna speak after me. So I won't get too far into what happens after they come back. Um, I do wanna also talk about, well, your question about mail ballot precincts. We do have mail ballot precincts in Minnesota. At the end of 2020, there were about 1,300, 1,345 mail ballot precincts that contained about 197,000 registered voters. And the distinction with mail ballot precincts, number one, it's townships in greater Minnesota and cities under 400 registered voters in greater Minnesota. And what these precincts are is that registered voters in those precincts automatically get mailed a ballot. They do not have to do the absentee application because they are, this is a slightly different process. So every registered voter in those precincts automatically gets mailed a ballot. But again, there's information that gets matched up, the voter's name, signature, and then in typical years, there's a witness requirement, as you mentioned, Nancy, but that was weighed by a consent decree this year. But again, there are things that tie that ballot back into SVRS with the barcode on the materials coming back and to ensure that Nobody gets to vote more than one ballot. If, if there's an existing record in SVRS, then steps, counties have to take steps to either spoil the ballot that's in there to mail a new one, or they would reject something that looked fishy. Um, and with that, I think I answered the three questions you asked me. You did I'm great. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Wow. 
Well, thanks so much, David. Um, it's very helpful to understand how the process is designed to work. And as you mentioned, we're also happy to have with us tonight, Paul Huffman, who is an election judge. Thank you for serving, Paul. And uh, was also part of the ballot board in Washington County who can shed more light on how that process actually unfolded um, at the ballot board levels um, as the ballots are first opened and processed. Paul? All right, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, and uh, as you said, I'm an election judge, so I've worked election day a number of times, but I never understood or never had experienced what actually happens with the absentee ballot. So I uh, took the opportunity to serve on the ballot board in Washington County uh, for the general election. And, and for those who don't know, the ballot board is that group of people for your county who receives processes, validates uh, the absentee ballots, and then gets them ready to feed into the counting machine at the, at the county level. So uh, these are primarily election judges. Um, they can't, it can include county employees. Um, the election judges all have to identify a party affiliation because one of the requirements is that you can't have two election judges of the same party working together. And that's one of the the safeguards in the system, one of the uh, protections in the process to make sure that that uh, there's the integrity. And, and I would tell you that that I was really impressed with the integrity and, of the process, uh, how the people work together. Uh, nobody ever talks about what party they are, but but you know that whatever party you've uh, you know identified in alignment with, that other person is something else. And there's four major parties, so you know the, you just don't know where that other person is at. Um, so really there's two pieces of the process at the county. Uh, the first part of that is uh, receiving and verifying the, the uh, validity of the absentee ballot. So they get the, the election judges and the county staff, they get all the uh, absentee ballots that come in for the day. Um, you know, once they start coming in, what they'll do is they'll check and make sure that the person who has uh, uh, put their name on that absentee ballot on the signature envelope, um, is uh, actually registered to vote. They'll check the registration database that uh, David talked about. Um, they will verify that it's signed and also verify that person hasn't voted um, because as they talked about, uh, there is a database that's updated uh, with when people have voted. Um, and so assuming that the idea is correct, the name is correct, the barcode aligns with what the uh, person is who uh, requested that absentee ballot because that way you can't vote somebody else's absentee ballot. Um, then once all those things are aligned uh, and it's properly signed and if the witness signature is there as required, um, then that ballot is accepted. And that's the point at which, you know, now if there's somebody who's now um, registering to vote, they'll also have some identification that the voter registration is included. There's a witness for that. Uh, so those people who receive that, the election judges who receive the uh, signature envelopes, they're verifying all that information to, to provide assurance that that person is eligible to vote. They are who, who requested the ballot and they haven't voted before so that they're voting only one time. At that point in the system, they, they indicate the ballot is has been received and accepted and will be counted. And if you ever use the absentee ballot tracking tool on the Secretary of State's website, you know, you'll see that your ballot has been accepted and will be counted. And since I'd never been in the ballot board, you know, I didn't know the mechanics of that. But what that means is that's been through that first check of the ballot board. They verified the eligibility and it's now been put into a stack of ballots that are ready to count once we get within the window where we can count ballots before the election day. Now for this last election, that was 14 days prior to election day is typically seven days by law. Um, and so what happened seven days prior is, and I was in that group of ballot board members and there were about 25 of us that came in um, you know, to the room. Uh, we paired up and the tables, we had some runners to help move things around. So we're, we're processing almost 10,000 ballots a day and we get the signature envelopes. And the first thing we do is we go through in pairs and we're just taking stacks of signature envelopes, taking the ballot secrecy envelopes out of those, segregating the, uh, the signature envelopes for retention because those are kept in case somebody wants a record of, you know, who actually voted and where's their documentation of that. So those get kept. Um, and then we take all the ballots out of the secrecy envelope uh, make a big stack, make sure they're not damaged, make sure there's no stray marks so that they'll go through the counting machine. Um, you know, again, we're doing this in pairs. And uh, as we go through, we're, we're talking to each other and we're looking at ballots. And if one of us has a question about 
is this okay? Is that okay? We can, with, we'll can. we ask the question and we'll verify with our partner um, whether what we're doing is acceptable or if we need to get additional help from the county elections staff for that. Um, so then once, you know, that assures that separation of the signature envelope from the secrecy envelope assures that we don't know whose ballot is whose. And even if you've got a really small precinct and you may have a, you know, whatever, sometimes you had like 10 ballots, by the time you separate those signature envelopes from the, the ballot envelopes, we have no idea what goes with what, we just don't. Um, so you get that, that confidentiality of your vote. Um, and so then what happens is once we get, get the ballots out of the, the uh, secrecy envelope, we'll go through, make sure it's for the right precinct because every once in a while somebody may get the wrong ballot. Um, we make sure that again, it's not damaged or there's no street marks. And for example, sometimes people will go through and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll put a, a circle in the dot for the, the uh, candidate they wanna select and then they'll X through that and they mark another dot if that goes through the scanning machine that the county has, then it's going to get kicked back. Or if it's torn for some reason, if they did something in the putting it into the ballot envelope to send it back and it's damaged. So what we'll do is there's a separate team of uh, election judges, again, of different parties, and they will go through based on guidance provided by the state and the county and determine the intent of the, the, uh, the uh, voter. And it's pretty generally, it's pretty easy to determine if they think they made a mistake um, and they wanted to vote somebody else, it's pretty easy to determine. Now, if we can't figure out what the voter intended, we don't try to guess. Um, the ballot goes through the way it goes through and we get concurrence from the uh, election officials who know more about the regulation than we do. So, and then once we get through that whole process, uh, those two other you know, election judges will duplicate the ballot if need be, again, different parties, they're looking at the original ballot, looking at the duplicated ballot, just to make sure that we've got that record. And then that goes through, this, you know, through uh, the accounting process. And so then you've got the counted ballots that have been verified, the integrity is there, the eligibility is there, and then uh, you know, the uh, votes are counted. The one thing I'll mention is that you know, at times people are not sure if their vote, that vote ballot's gonna get to the uh, election office in time you know, slowdowns in the mail. And so what happens is once, uh, if they've already voted, you look at that front end, if somebody's voted in person, they've gone to do uh, uh, early absentee voting in person, as Dave was talking about, there'll be an indication in the system they've already voted. And so that ballot will be rejected. And matter of fact, there were about 370 instances across the state, which is a pretty small number where people, because of that concern for whether their absentee ballot was gonna get to the election office, they went ahead and voted and Secretary Simon for the election had given counsel to many of us that are involved in elections that that was okay because we have processes to ensure that if their ballot is delayed that they can make their vote and have it counted. Awesome. So I like to a lot of what you're saying is a lot of things happened in twos, right? You were always in pairs. So that was always. a really good security function. Um, so thank you, Paul. That was a great explanation. So helpful. And I'm delighted now to turn to Michael Stahlberger, Director of Property and Environmental Resources in Blue Earth County, to help answer questions related to the process of voting early in person. So Michael, um, you know, what procedures and measures are there on site at all the early voting locations to ensure that some bad actor doesn't steal the ballots or stuff the ballot boxes? Those are some typical things sometimes we hear people feel like could happen. Absolutely. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to join you tonight. I thought it might be helpful for me just to give a real quick uh, introduction to Blue Earth County so folks know the lay of the land, uh, the voters that we work with. And so uh, we are a county in South Central Minnesota. Our county seat is Mankato. That's our largest city. Uh, we're home to about 40,000 registered voters. And we have a really interesting blend of voters uh, that are in rural townships voting in the town halls, uh, to uh, male voters, to people who are actually in, in our college communities. We have a couple of very engaged college communities. So we serve a wide spectrum of voters, uh, just like the rest of the state. And so that brings some interesting uh, perspectives for us as we help our voters. Uh, the, the question about early voting, in-person early voting especially, is, is, is quite interesting to me. Um, Secretary Simon has said it in the past that we used to look at elections as being election day, right? And we've now moved to this concept that election day is the last day 
to vote. And we have all of these election days that run up to it. And so this early voting piece and people being able to feed their ballot directly into the machine is something that's uh, gained a lot of, uh, of acceptance in Minnesota. A lot of folks are enjoying picking voting on the day that works best for them when it's most convenient to their home lives. And so we've brought in all of these safeguards and, and protections into that election realm, just like we would do on election day. And so some of the things that I like to, to mention in, in specifically in regards to that is we look at uh, securing the election from the results side and making sure that we have the right people voting in the right locations, that they meet the requirements to vote, that they vote only once. But we also have the logistics or the safety piece, which would be where we're securing the ballots and the ballot bins and balancing everything out at the end of the night. And we bring all of those pieces together on each of our early voting days when we vote in person, just like we do on election day. Um, and we use a lot of the same methods that have already been mentioned there. Um, if we have uh, election judge, we have election judges who are working with the ballots once we're auditing them at the end of the night, two election judges making sure that folks are double checking that work. Uh, we have other securities in place in terms of auditing to make sure that the number of votes that were cast on that early voting day matches the number of ballots in the machine and that we can work through any issues there and reconcile them. And then we of course um, use double checks in those instances. There's a couple of things about elections administrators that people should know. We're planners. We have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. In 2020, we had a plan X, Y, and Z. Um, but we also like to double check and triple check things. And so we would, would run a report out of the state system to see how many voters voted that day in that location. And then we check that to the number of ballots. And then we'll do it again with a different set of judges, just always to make sure that we're in the right place at the end of the night. And at least for Blue Earth County, that was our rule. You don't go home until the night balances so that we can start that next day new and have a, another early voting election day for us. Um, if I want to get a little bit more deeper into the, the physical security pieces there, the, even the placement of that ballot bin is very important. We always have judges that are around that and that ballot bin isn't close to the door. Uh, we have ways to monitor the ballots that are going in there uh, based on the judge's initials or even in Blue Earth County, the color of pens used for those judge's initials so that we know that that ballot was received that day into that machine. So there's those very small things that people aren't gonna observe um, unless they're involved in the election and they can see how that all works. Um, one of the other things that I think is really important to point out with this is that we've heard from David, we've heard from Paul that we are using the statewide system. Uh, it's a statewide voter registration system. It's our way to, to make sure that we've got all of our registered voters accounted for. It's a way to track our absentee ballot process. And that same system is used for our early voting. And so when that person completes an application to vote in person, feed their ballot into the machine, we're still running that through a statewide system to make sure that they didn't vote in St. Louis County or in Dakota County or in Washington County or wherever it might be. And we'll make sure that that's verified out before we give them a ballot. Because that is the big difference with this early voting in person is that ballots going into a machine. And so we want to be extra sure that that person's casting their one and only vote when they feed that into the machine. Because once it's in there, it's a secret ballot and we can't remove that ballot from that, that cycle for that individual. Um, a couple of other things that I can point out through that process with that statewide system is that it does also work for our non-registered voters. Sometimes we would get that question, well, if I don't want you to find me in the system, I just won't use my registration information. As David mentioned, you have to provide some personally identifiable information. Last four of your social, a driver's license or ID number, we're gonna run a check on that if we can't find you based on your name or a registered voter status, just to make sure that there's nothing like that going on throughout the system. And one of the things that worked really well for us in Blue Earth County this past year uh, with the number of folks we had coming in and, and some uh, time that we wanted to make sure we spent to get everything right is we actually work that into our script with our uh, serving our voters as they were coming in, explaining them that we collect that information so that we can put it into a statewide system. And we've got to wait for it to come back and tell us that a ballot hasn't already been accepted for you. Make sure that everything's set to go. And that helped a lot of our voters get that reassurance right before they actually cast their ballot to know that we're doing our job to make sure that they're voting once and that it's the right person voting once. So I hope that helps out um, in terms of what happens to help with a fair and accurate election. It's really like we get to have multiple elections. We don't just wait for that second Tuesday in the month or the first Tuesday after the first Monday. Um, 
we work through that on a regular basis and we've got some good safeguards in place to help us uh, preserve that election. Awesome, thank you, Michael. Now you revealed your, your special colored pen secret though. We'll pull new ones out next time, don't worry. That's a great, but another great little measure, right? Of uh, ways to double check. So uh, thanks again. And so this information right now all comes up to the actual election day when everything comes together. And Pat Dolan is with us, to, who is a, a wonderful seasoned head election judge here. And Pat, it's a busy day, right, for all of you. And, and we know that this is a unique process in Minnesota. And I know you're excited about how same day voter registration works. So if you can talk a little bit about that and how you can be sure that people are who they say they are. And then just share with us, especially that, that role of how those final votes are tabulated, absentee ballots and how we can feel confident that the vote results aren't compromised. I mean, the more I hear about all the things that go on, I feel bad for complaining how long it takes election results. Cause now I can see all the tabulating you do. So if you can shed some light on all that for us, we'd love it. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I've been a head election judge in Washington County for I think four years now. So, um, you know, the first time you become a head election judge, it's you're just like scared to death you're going to make a mistake. So the double checking and triple checking, we all have to be such good planners in order to make uh, it a success. Um, before I talk about um, uh, election day registration, I want to just talk a little bit about the registration judge, because the registration judge, when someone comes in to vote, uh, they ask the voters for a name. We don't ask for an ID, but we ask them for their name and their address. And we use that in order to have them verify that we have found them. They are in the right precinct and they certify themselves. As a registration judge, if you are person comes in and gives you a name and there is an AB by their name, that indicates that they have already voted. So they are not allowed to vote again if we have an AB in our register indicating they've already voted. So that's a check as well in order to make sure that we don't have people voting more than once in an election. I find it really fabulous that Minnesota has election day registration because there are things that come up that people move, they change their name, they get married. Um, those things require that they re-register to vote. And so when they come in, if they uh, need to register to vote, uh, as Secretary Simon said, they have to provide uh, an identification of who they are. That can be any kind of ID. It can even be an expired Minnesota driver's license. We will take that as an identification. They then have to provide something that shows that they live where they say they do. And again, it can be any kind of a bill, something like that in order to verify that that's where they are. Uh, this was mentioned earlier as well. If if um, they don't have um, a, a bill because they just moved and they don't have anything with that on, then they can have somebody who uh, votes in that same precinct vouch for them. So it is a very wonderful process that we allow people to vote that same day and register to vote in the precinct that they, that they are voting in. Um, as far as the end of day, the end of the day is, is a multifaceted process. The first thing we do when, the, when we close the polls is we look at the ballot box in order to determine the number on the ballot box of how many ballots have been cast that day. That number is given to the registration judges, the ballot judges, and then lastly, we'll count ballots. But all those things have to match with that number on the ballot box. So the registration judges have to show um, that they their numbers add up to the number on the ballot box. The number of ballots issued has to match what's on that uh, machine. And then lastly, and it's normally more than two judges, is generally four to six judges will physically remove the ballots from the ballot box and count them. And we normally count twice each thing to get them to match up to that ballot box. After the ballots are counted, the ballots are secured in a banker's box. It is sealed, it is signed by election judges, and we print a results tape out of the machine. Uh, that'll tell us you know, the, the results of who voted for what. You don't know individual, it just gives you the totals. All of that information at the end of the day is then transported 
normally by the head judge or co-head judge out to um, county. In my case, it's Washington County and Stillwater where we deliver all of that material back to our election officials there. And they verify that we have done all of the things that are necessary in order for each precinct to close out that evening. So it is a multifaceted, very detailed process in order to ensure that every ballot is counted and everything matches. Awesome. Well, thank you, Pat. And thanks, especially for serving as an election judge. We need more of you. Um, I'd like to now take just a minute to hear from Phil Chapman, the election supervisor for St. Louis County, to hear how that handoff of all that information occurs uh, from the precinct to the county. Um, so if you can talk, Phil, tonight about some of those measures that are in place to ensure ballot security once all of the materials are handed off to county officials. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on the security. Um, a lot of people think, you know, at the end of the election night or after election day, the only items we're getting are ballots and summary tapes. There's actually quite a bit more uh, election materials that we're receiving from the precinct. We're getting uh, ballots, um, discs from the machines. We're getting rosters, election day registrations. Um, so and incident logs and all that ties together, you know, as we were kind of moving through this presentation, all that information is used to audit the statistics at the, um, you know, after election day. And we'll talk about that in a little later in the presentation. So when the precincts bring in their materials to us, we have a drop location. Uh, we have two teams of two uh, that go out and, you know, get the materials. Uh, this year we use the election judges, one from each each party, you know, their differing parties to uh, check in the materials. So while the person is there from the precinct, we open up their supply box, we go through it and make sure we're receiving, you know, the sealed ballots, the tabulation uh, discs, rosters, election day registration, incident logs, you know, things like that. So. While the person is actually standing there, we have people that go, teams that go through the box and uh, check up. Um, and we also have them sign the log. So when somebody drops it off, we they have everything there. Uh, you know, they, they sign off to attest that they delivered it. Um, you know, and there, there has been times where we've missed things or things have been missing, maybe a half a roster was brought back and we've had to send people back to their polling location to retrieve the rest. Um, you know, so that, that does happen. Um, you know, everything, once we get it, we have everything under dual control. And I'll talk a little bit about the safeguarding of the materials. Uh, once we get it, we have a secure storage location uh, that we bring the items to. And what we do is we've changed the locks to the secure area prior to the election. Uh, the only people that have keys to the to get into the room are the county auditor and the election supervisor. Um, even building maintenance doesn't have a key or commissioners or the administrator, no one else has a key to that area. It is under uh, video surveillance. So if we ever need to look at to see who was in the room, you know, we can we can look at that. Uh, we also have uh, a sign-in sheet. Uh, so when we're, if we do have to access the room, uh, we have, again, dual control, two people going in there and they're required to sign off on a sheet why they were in, in the room, um, what time they went in there, what time they exited. Um, so we take uh, safeguarding the election material very serious once, once we get it into our building. Um, a couple things I wanted to touch a little bit, you know, the memory sticks, you know, from the machines, you know, I, I hear out there, you know, people saying, well, gee, you know, somebody hacked into the machine and they changed vote totals. Uh, with, with the county, our machines aren't tied to the internet. There's no modem connected to the machine. Each one of those cards has a serial number from the machine. So, there's no way somebody could physically hack in or remotely hack into that machine because they're not tied to the internet. They're also locked in the machine. Uh, the election judges or the, the clerk has the key for that. Uh, the disc is locked in there and is secure throughout the whole day. Um, 
so as we get go through our supplies and we're pulling out the election disks and things, again, I, each one of those disks is encrypted with the machine number on it. So when we pull the information into our software, uh, we can only pull the information from one, one disk, the results, we can't double load because the, the software knows that we already loaded information from that specific machine. Um, once we pull the, you know, get the disk from all the precincts, we're uploading the information to the Secretary of State's website. And that's done on a website connected via uh, an encrypted SSL connection. So that's highly secure. Uh, and that's really the only point that we're transmitting totals is, is that one point. Um, trying to, as we, as we complete our audit process, so we have our information materials in that security area. As we complete our audit process, we're done with the contest period and all the recounts, and then we physically move all that into permanent storage. And again, that's done under dual control. Uh, we, we store our items on a, a floor that has key card access to the elevator. So only certain staff have access to even get to the floor. And then again, in that area that we store the materials, uh, is one one key or two keys, the auditor and myself, are the only people that have access to that room even after the election. Um, and then the items uh, are retained for 22 months. Uh, so even after the election is over, you know, it, it's kept on site for 22 months. Wow. Whoa, you've got, that's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot going on there at that county office. Well, um, I want to thank you. We're going to start. We're going to end tonight too. We'll swing back to that final audit process. But I, I also want to take us a little bit deeper into um, into the machines. And we want to welcome now Andy Loken, Elections Director for Dakota County. And we've heard a lot about voting machines in this election. Um, so if you can talk about our voting equipment, what you used in Dakota County, how it's tested, certified, and how we can prevent, and Phil just did a great job of talking right now about how we can prevent hacking and all those great things. So how can we make sure that the voting totals that are reported are actually what the ballots recorded? Oh, sure thing. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting inviting me to speak. Um, uh, we we uh, we take it all very seriously, like all the other folks on this call. Um, very take our security very seriously. Um, so I'll talk about uh, the voting equipment, kind of where it starts. I think it's probably pretty safe to say that voting equipment gets tested more than it gets used, um, because <laughs> you know it starts out um, actually at the very beginning. Um, in Minnesota, you can't buy a voting system that hasn't been certified by the EAC. So, so we only buy certified equipment. Okay, once that equipment, what's, um, but you still can't use it because it has to be certified by the Secretary of State's office to make sure that it meets the particular requirements in Minnesota. So, so the EAC in conjunction with these voluntary testing laboratories um, test the voting equipment, to, uh, they do the drop test, they do the billion ballot test, and then it comes to Minnesota and they do the party column ballot and the other things that are particular to Minnesota. So you have a system that, that fully meets the requirements of Minnesota. Um, and then uh, once we get it, uh, you know, we take a lot of steps to make sure that it's safe. Um, a lot of these, a lot of the folks on this call already mentioned a lot of the, the same practices. You know, we work in pairs, we use multi-factor authentication. Uh, we use locked storage, you know, the ballot counters are loaded with hasps and little little seal spots so you can you can seal them up pretty tight. Um, so they're very, they're very uh, uh, physically secure themselves. Uh, we also maintain um, uh, secure security for uh, all the other materials. Uh, there's four people in the county who have access to our to our memory cards and uh, I'm one of them. Uh, but so and then the other thing is actually very simple. Um, we turn the equipment off between elections. Um, there was a there was a Pew did a study a couple of years ago where they had actually pinged uh, a few a few states that had voting systems. They, Minnesota was not among them, thankfully. Um, we we turn our equipment off between elections. Um, so so the main thing uh, that we do uh, to prevent voting machines from being hacked, like I said, the, the physical security. How do we know the totals that we are reported are actually what's recorded? Uh, so we talked, you know, and Phil talked about this very nice. Um, and, and Pat talked about this process where we get the results from the precinct uh, to, to the website, but, but what people don't know is that that's, those are just unofficial. Um, that, that what actually gets canvassed, and I'm pretty sure every county does this, is we take the results that Pat and the other election judges sign in the polling place, 
And we sit down with the canvas that we're going to ask to be certified and we proof them. And if they don't match, we figure out why. And it's never been hacking. No one ever gets into that stuff. But we know that the, the, the totals uh, that were certified in the, in the precinct are the ones that our canvassing board certifies and that we pass up to the Secretary of State's office. So, so um, I mean, it's really uh, just tested beginning to end. Um, so the testing process, uh, how do we know that this stuff's actually counting the ballots that are put in, in, uh, in accurately? Well, there's a lot of steps um, that, that go into that. Um, the, 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 there's a lot of rules in Minnesota that actually dictate exactly what you're supposed to do. But basically what you do is you take what's called a test deck and it's a pre-audited set of ballots. And then you have this thing called a test deck spreadsheet or some people call it an edit listing, but a test deck spreadsheet. And that has the results for each ballot um, in that test deck. And so what you do is you get these election judges and they feed the ballots through the ballot counter and they do other things while they're doing it. They make sure that the accessible equipment works for it. They make sure that all the functional groups that the printer prints everything that you'd expect it to. And they get done putting this test deck through the, through the machine. And uh, um, they do it generally for both memory cards as well. So it gets tested twice um, and then it gets sealed up. Um, and the, and the, uh, the election judges certify, certify that they have uh, uh, accurately tested it. Um, and if it, doesn't, um, if it doesn't pass, you keep testing until it's right. Um, every ballot counter I've ever seen counts accurately. It's always been human error, but you still, you go through until it's right. So, um, and then that's just the preliminary testing. And then there's, a, there's another sampling of, of uh, ballot counters. It's a minimum, of, it's, it's a little convoluted, but it's like three minimum per district. And um, so they do a public test that no one ever shows up to, but it's public, it's published. There's a contact, you know, that you can, you can go to it for any district you want. Um, and uh, they, they do a demonstration of exactly what I just described. They uh, go through and they test the accessible equipment. They make sure the test deck works and then, and then they sign to it and it's done. And then it all gets sealed back up again. So the stuff is sealed while it's not in use. We use security procedures, it's all certified. Uh, the equipment is, is very, very, uh, very secure and accurate in Minnesota. And then uh, to top it all off at the very end of the, uh, at the very end of the, uh, after a general election, we do a thing called a post election review. And I know you're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but uh, basically we take the top three offices on the ballot, do a hand count of them. Uh, there's an escalation procedure if uh, they were actually um, be miscounted. But what you're looking for is uh, that the equipment counts accurately, but you don't count against it the things that uh, the voter, where a voter made a mistake, like they circle the ballot or they, they put, you know, they get cornflakes on it or something. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you, that doesn't count against the equipment, but the equipment is always dead accurate. So, um, wow, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andy. And we're right on time. We've got about another 13 minutes to get us to the through the auditing phase now, because this is probably what the public knows least about. And I um, want to welcome and bring Deborah Erickson into the conversation tonight, who is the Administrative Services Director for Crow Wing County, and also serves on the U.S. Election Assistant Commission Standards Board. So um, Deborah, um, viewing and guarding of the ballots, and Andy was just starting to talk about that, the fact that the public does have access, things can be viewed. Is there anything else you wanna add about the security measures in place for election equipment? And can you um, under, help us understand how ballots are secured and their counting made available to viewing by the public? Sure, thank you, Michelle, and thank you for having us tonight. One of the things that I think everybody has touched on is all the different layers of security that goes into an election. And I always used to laugh because when I would say that I work in elections, people ask me, well, what do you do for the other 364 days every other year? You know, it's not a one day a year, every two years type of a job. There are so many things that go into this. I am uh, fortunate, I'm honored to serve on the EAC Standards Board as the local representative from the state of Minnesota with David as our state representative as well. And one of the things I think that makes our country so unique is we do not have a federal election system. We have federal standards that are set, but each state is responsible for setting their own laws and rules. And each local jurisdiction is responsible for administering those elections, as Secretary Simon said earlier. This decentralization really is one of the biggest security measures that we do have in our system because there is not one set of equipment that can be hacked or that something can be done that way. And we do have so much opportunity for the public to be involved in this process that transparency really is the key name of the game as we go through everything that is involved. When you vote by absentee ballot, you have that opportunity to follow the tracking of your ballot application 
from the time you submit it until your ballot is accepted. When you are dealing with equipment, we have, as Andy mentioned, three or four layers of testing that goes into play. While this is a great safeguard that we have in place in the country because not everybody uses the same thing, it also does allow for some misinformation because what may be true in one state is not true in another state. And I think that's really what we heard a lot of this year with regard to some of the concerns or issues that certain people were seeing even down to what type of pen was used to mark their ballot with. I don't know how many calls I answered after election day about what type of Sharpie pen was provided to the voter in their polling place. When we talk about the security of the equipment, as Andy mentioned, those machines are sealed after the public testing is done or after the preliminary testing is done. And when we talk sealing, we're talking little padlocks that are actually have a number on them, a serial number on them that the election judges in the polling place have to verify on election morning to make sure that that hasn't changed. They also have to verify that that tape that's being printed out of their equipment is showing zeros to start the day and that it matches the ballots that they have for their polling place. And Minnesota having those paper ballots as that last step is really that key piece that always leads us back to being able to have that paper trail. We're big on paper trails. As Michael mentioned, we love to count things three or four times, but we're also really keen on paper trails. When our clerks or our election judges are taking materials from those offices, we are having them sign their life away with, this is what you're taking and you need to bring everything back. Whatever you left with, all of it has to come back as well. So we all have these paper trails that we are tracking for that security purpose. When it comes to the public, they do have access to the public accuracy test. It's literally right in the name. Please come and see how those machines are intended to work so you can see what confidence you have there. At the polling location on election day, Minnesota has a challenger law. There can be challengers in the polling place, but it's a little bit different than other states who have poll watchers or poll observers who are there watching what's going on. In Minnesota, the law is specifically saying that a challenger can make a challenge to a voter's eligibility to vote in that polling place if the challenger has personal knowledge that that voter is not eligible. So it's a slightly different situation. The same pertains when we talk about absentee ballots. Paul talked about how that absentee ballot board reviews every ballot envelope for that accepting and rejecting process. Really that could be open to a public challenger if they had personal knowledge that that voter was not eligible, they could challenge that ballot board's right to accept or reject that. What the public does not have access to is the actual feeding of a ballot into a machine. If you think about the polling location, you can't have someone who's just sitting around all day watching the voters as they're placing their ballots into the tabulator. The same is true with absentee ballot boards. When they are feeding them into the machines, that part is not open to the public, but that final tabulation, that reconciliation that Pat was talking about, all of that is open and open to the public, whether it be for absentee ballots or whether it be in the polling place on election day. Once eight o'clock hits and those final voters are done voting, those polling locations are open to the public for anybody who wants to come and observe that process happening as well. While we don't have poll watchers or poll observers, there is a provision in law that allows people to fill out a state election law complaint if they do think that there is something untoward that is happening in a polling place or in violation of any election law. Those forms are available at every polling place from an election office or available on the Secretary of State's website as well. If someone has a specific violation of a law that they feel has been violated, they can fill out that form, turn it into their county attorney or submit it to the Secretary of State's office who will then turn it over to the county attorney as well. Transparency is key. We always welcome questions. As election administrators, I think this is our, our thing we love the most is when people come to us and ask the questions to really get the true information. And we really wanna get that information out to people as much as we can. Thank you so much. And um, we've only got about six or seven minutes left, but we want to um, end today. Welcome back, Phil Chapman, and also uh, Nancy Nelson, the auditor for St. Louis County. And Phil and Nancy, if you could help us better understand what takes place of that post-election to audit our election system and to sure, ensure accuracy even after, after the vote is done. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, um, you know, Andy had talked a, a little bit about as far as uh, using the summary statements and the information to verify the canvas, you know, the inf canvas information. That's kind of our first step as uh, in the county auditor's office. Um, 
we take the summary statements and we review all the information, all the statistics, double, triple check it to make sure that is correct. Uh, so that's kind of the first post-election audit, I'll, I'll call, call it. Um, you know, if something is questionable or doesn't quite match up, as Deb said, Minnesota, we are highly paper intensive. Um, so we can always go take a look at the paper documents and reconcile things that way. So when we have questions, we can look at the paper and we can reconcile it back. Um, so that's kind of the first step is to, as the auditor's office, we, we go back and we, we reconcile um, the statistics, the voting uh, totals. Uh, once the information is canvassed, then we moved into our post-election review. And I don't think a lot of people are aware that this happens. This is open to the public. And what this is, is, is uh, a random selection of precincts uh, that are drawn at the canvassing board. And then we, you know, the county auditor oversees, um, typically, uh, oversees it. And what we do is we hand count the uh, ballots to make sure that they match up with the uh, machine, how the machine counted it. Um, excuse me, precincts are like, as I said, in the canvassing board, they're randomly drawn. And it's based on two things. One, either the number of registered voters that you have in your jurisdiction. So if you're under 100,000, uh, it's, it's a criteria based on that. Uh, if it's over 100,000, it's based on the number of precincts. Um, for St. Louis County, we hand counted six precincts that were drawn and we were underneath uh, the established um, threshold for the error rate. Um, and I think it was Andy had talked a little bit about it. Um, you know, there's thresholds out there and if you, are not under the threshold in this, uh, I think I wrote it down here. Uh, you cannot have a difference of a half a percent uh, for 400 votes cast or um, for uh, less, more than two uh, if, if you have a precinct under 400. Um, again, this is open to the public. The public can come and watch this and, and actually see, and we, we actually do have people that come in and observe this. Um, we have teams of two that count this and we're recon basically reconciling back the numbers that were uh, put out on the uh, Secretary of State's or counted on with the machine. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch about on briefly was the recount. Um, you know, in addition to the post-election review, you know, that's automatic. We're required to do that for every state election. Uh, candidates can request um, a recount of, of their race if they choose to. Uh, they can either, if it meets a threshold, they can have a publicly funded recount, uh, or uh, they could also request a, a discretionary recount. And this again is open to the public, is done in teams of two. And I just wanted to bring up, you know, typically when recounts are held, it shows that the original totals were highly accurate. There's very few changes. Uh, for St. Louis County, for the 2020 general election, we had two recounts. Uh, recounted, we recounted a total of 35 precincts. Uh, 17,754 ballots were recounted by hand. And we had a net change of seven votes, which amounted to less than a half percent of the total votes cast. And some of the cha net changes were voter intent. You know, maybe we had a person cross out a candidate and circle it which the machine, the way they're programmed, they count that as an overvote. So it's not totally, it's not machines reading the information incorrectly. It's just, you know, a lot of it's voters uh, voting intent once we do the hand call, so. That's awesome. Phil, that's so helpful to have those actual numbers too. I think that is really helpful for people to see what those are. And I know a lot of those things are also reported in reports that are available on the Secretary of State's website. Um, we're getting to the very end. Nancy, did you have anything you want to add? I know you brought you brought Phil here, so because he's in the field and doing it. Anything? Oh, yes. Um, no, I, I just want to thank you for, for doing this presentation. Um, I know the legal women voters are very, very uh, active and um, they really do a good job getting the word out. And, um, and so I, I just wanna thank you for, for putting this presentation together. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, I want to thank all of our participants tonight um, also for being on, for sure all our panelists. As you can tell, we had great information and we can't get to a lot of the questions that you answered or asked, but I am committed to um, being able to answer those questions. So we are taking note of the questions. We will um, indeed try to answer those questions. I'm sure our panelists would lend themselves to an email from me to get those final answers. There's a lot of good ones there. And we do intend to put this on a special web page that we're doing with the League of Women Voters so that we continue to document uh, the systems and measures we have in place so that we have good information out there um, to replace any disinformation. A lot of the questions tonight were about that. How do we talk to people who don't believe the information? And um, those are great questions. And we want to continue to do that. And, and largely, the first step is tonight, building that information pool. I think um, hearing all of you and all the steps that are involved uh, just are such good evidence of why we can feel good that our elections not feel good actually know that our elections will were fair and accurate right it's not a feel good it's actually a a double checking dual all the great things you've said tonight so um so we will have that and we'll send that out to everybody so thank you again and i'd like to ask secretary simon if you can just um give us a little um shout out at the end here as we wrap up our evening well i'll and where I began, which is with the big thank you to you, Michelle, and to your team and to the League of Women Voters of Minnesota for doing this. This is a real public service. And I'm so glad that this is going to be kept and the public can access this afterwards because it really is important for us to set the record straight. We have a great thing going in Minnesota. I often say, you know, democracy and elections are a team sport and look no further than the people on this panel for outstanding teammates. Uh, so many of them uh, were just heroic this year and others who weren't on this call. We did this during a once in a century pandemic. It's hard enough to pull off uh, a statewide election under normal circumstances, but the people you're looking at here did this in a once in a century pandemic. Extra obstacles, extra challenges, and yet despite all of that, Minnesota performed at the very highest level, not just in terms of being number one in turnout, again for the third time in a row, but in terms of um, the absolute best in terms of service, in terms of accuracy, in terms of honesty and integrity. Minnesota really is among the states that are the gold standard and it's because of the folks here uh, on this panel who explained to you, I think very compellingly, why that is the case. Uh, part of its laws, but part of its people. People doing a very good and competent and thorough job. And I think you've seen plenty of evidence of that here tonight. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, again, for your time and for all of our attendees for you taking the time to learn. We'll keep educating you as we go through this process again, I'm sure. Take care and good night.